Welcome to How Delivering Against Consumer Core Values Will Help Drive Business Growth, sponsored by PayPal. Here's our host, Vice President, Digital and In-Store Commerce at PayPal, Jason Test. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Test. I'm the Vice President of Digital and In-Store Commerce at PayPal, and I'm thrilled to be your host today. I think we're going to have a fantastic event. I really think you're going to get a lot of value out of it. We have some great guests. And we also want this to be an engaging conversation today. So uh, I'll direct your attention to the bottom of the screen where uh, you can find a lot of additional resources and you can even submit questions for our guests. Uh, and also feel free to join in on the conversation on social using hashtag PayPal webinar and hashtag customer retention. We're also interested in your feedback. So there's a survey that you can find at the bottom of the page and just click on that icon to provide some survey feedback at the end. Okay, so let's get going. And before I invite our next guest in, uh, I really just wanted to provide some background and context on our topic today, delivering against consumer core values. I, I'm pretty sure we can all relate to the fact that over the last few years, uh, we've gone through a lot of change and, and it's been some unusual times and consumer values have really changed and evolved as many people have taken an opportunity to really reflect on and, and reassess what's important in their lives. Uh, and for all of us in our line of work, it's really important that we keep track of that, right? The importance of understanding how consumer values have evolved, the impact those changes uh, are having on how consumers are purchasing um, is really important for us to be able to continue to drive growth. And for most of us, what we value determines what we do. And so with that in mind, at PayPal, uh, we did some research. We wanted to go out and talk to our users and really understand uh, what, what's on their minds. So we did some research to really understand the shared values of the 425 million uh, active users that we have across the globe. And we wanted to look deeply and understand their core values and uh, what's really behind the decisions that they're making and including shopping preferences. So today we're gonna pass along uh, that research to you to help you understand uh, a little bit more about how to engage our PayPal audiences who are highly engaged shoppers, right? They tend to uh, spend 12% more when they shop and they tend to complete 34% percent more uh, checkouts. And to share those research findings, I'm pleased to introduce David Allison, the founder of Value Graphics. David, welcome. Thank you, Jason, and thank you everybody who's tuned in to watch this today. I have a really interesting message I can't wait to share with you. And there's two great things that are gonna happen as a result of this short time that we have together today. First off, I'm gonna show you some data and a new way of thinking about customers that's gonna mean you're gonna be able to do very, very well with whatever objectives you have in front of you at your organization. And at the same time you're doing that, we're all gonna be able to do a lot of good in the world. It's a one-two punch and I can't wait to share it with you. So let's get started. I wanna talk about the story of Bob and Sally. Now, before I got into the thing that I do now, this value graphics database and the value graphics project that we're working on, we're gonna talk about, I had my own marketing firm. And at one point we had about 40, 50 people and all we did was pay attention to clients that were in the real estate development industry. So people who are gonna build a big giant condo tower in downtown Gotham City or a resort community or an office park, didn't matter. We did this all over the world. And every single project we started began in the same way, much the way every project begins in any marketing situation, with a description of the target audience. And in our case, the description was pretty much always a set of aging baby boomers who were looking to move into a vertical environment where they could have their condo, sell their single family home in the suburbs, and maybe have a little bit of extra money in their pocket so that they could have a home um, somewhere warm to spend the summers. Now they ended up being so similar, all these demographic descriptions over the course of the 10 years we did this work, that I ended up giving them a code name. I just called them all Bob and Sally, because they were all pretty much the same. There's a little bit of psychographic information different on one and a little bit of information different on the other, but it all kind of boiled down to the same gang of folks, the aging baby boomers who had the money to be buying real estate, that's who we were there to target. So our clients would come to us, and they'd say, hey, we need you to help us sell out this condo tower. 
what should we do? What do we call this thing? What do the billboards look like? The TV commercials, the websites, what are we, all those different kinds of component parts that were necessary to get people to do this thing we wanted them to do. We'd go and spend a million dollars. Sometimes it would take a year. Sometimes it would take a couple of months. And the beautiful thing about this industry and how it led us to where we are today is within a period of time, there was a beginning, a middle, and an end. So unlike brand advertising that just goes on and on and on and on, we got to stand in a room about two years after we began and see the people who we'd managed to attract. We could look around and see who was in the room. Now it happened the same way every time we did this. I'd stand in that room, I'd have a glass of cheap champagne and a shrimp on a stick, and I'd look around and go, wow, there's about 10 or 15% of this room are Bob and Sally. Who are all these other people? Only 10 or 15% of the people in the room matched the target audience description. Who are all the rest of you? I hadn't spent any money talking to the rest of you. I hadn't talked, I hadn't created messages for them. We hadn't bought money. We hadn't spent any money in their channels. We hadn't done anything to attract 80 to 85% of the people in the room. So who were these mysterious 90% of the people in the room? That was the question that launched us into trying to figure out what made people do the things that they do. Now it sort of starts back here. Every organization, including yours, including Business Insider, including PayPal, including everybody who's watching today, we all wake up and try and do the same thing. We're all just trying to get some folks to do something we'd like them to do. It's really that simple. All the rest of it is just complications that humans like to place on top of bureaucracies to make companies more interesting and fun. Uh, but really at the core, we're all just here trying to get some folks to make a decision we'd like them to make. So it kind of begs the question, how do people decide to do something, including buying your products or services or brands? Let me tell you a story. It's called Three Friends in an Alley at Midnight. So three friends are out having a few drinks. They haven't seen each other for a long time because of COVID and isolation and lockdown, and now they can. So they're out at their favorite pub. They're having a great time. They've had maybe one or two, two drinks too many. So someone, the smart one in the group, puts up their hand and says, you know what, it's time for us to go. We should call it early morning tomorrow. Let's get out of here. So they put on their coats, they walk outside and they're walking down the street and they're punching each other and laughing and telling old college jokes and, you know, singing songs and being the noisy drunks like everybody is when they leave a bar late at, mid at midnight after having one too many drinks with their friends that they haven't seen for a while. And they turn a corner and there's this dark alley and they have to decide what they're going to do. Now, friend number one, the only thing we know for certain about friend number one is their primary value in life is adventure. And they can't wait to go down that dark alley. They think this is the best way this evening could end. I'm with my friends. I love you guys. We're a little drunk. Let's go down the dark alley and see what happens. Who knows how this will end? How much fun is that going to be? And friend number two, the only thing we know for certain is their primary value in life is safety. They don't want to go down that dark alley. They're thinking to themselves, my gosh, why would we go down this dark alley? That's crazy. I'm a little drunk. I love you guys. This isn't the... So they try and get everybody to change their mind. Let's go back to the bar, this person says. Let's turn on the lights. We might even need to call the police. The last thing we need to do is go down that dark alley at midnight. And the third friend, the only thing we know for certain about the third friend is their primary value in life is friendship. They don't really care if we go down the dark alley or we go back to the bar, as long as we stick together because we're a little bit drunk. I love you guys. That's the story. And the moral of the story is that we didn't need to know anything about these people, anything about those three individuals faced with this decision other than what they care about, what their values are. They didn't need to know either. They didn't check back into their demographics and say, well, gee, I'm faced with a dark alley at midnight. Am I 18 to 24, 25 to 36, 37 to 45? Am I male, female? Do I have a white collar job? Do I have a degree? Do I have a master's degree? None of that stuff matters. The only thing that matters when it comes to understanding how humans make decisions about anything is what do they care about deeply enough that it's one of their core human values. Now, it's not just me who has this story. If we look into the fields of behavioral science, they all tend to agree on this same point as well. Now, something you need to know about behavioral scientists who work in psychology, psychiatry, sociology, neurology, they don't agree on very much. 
But one thing they do agree on is this basic principle that what we value determines everything that we do. And that we can't help ourselves. As human beings, we are biologically, neurologically, psychologically hardwired to wake up every morning and make decisions all day long that align with our values. That's it. Let's talk about neurology specifically. Neurologists will talk to you about the prefrontal cortex of your brain. Now, you've heard it referred to as the CEO of your brain. So the CEO of your brain decides how you're going to behave. It makes all the calls in terms of what decisions you're going to make. Looks at all the incoming data and sits there at its big prefrontal cortex desk like a good CEO and says, wow, look at all this stuff. Well, based on what I can see here, we're going to go that way. We're going to go that way. Something comes along that might be good for your family, your prefrontal cortex, if family is one of your values. We'll say, gee, we need to get that thing. Let's go chase that and we'll feel happy if we get that. Something comes along that might be bad for your family if family is one of your core values. And your prefrontal cortex is going to say, well, gee, we should avoid this. Let's get away from here. And we're going to feel anxious just as an incentive to make sure that we get away from this thing that might be bad for one of our values. Our prefrontal cortex only uses that one set of filters to make every decision on our behalf. What does this human being value? In fact, what we value determines everything we do. Whether we know it or not, always has, always will, all our decisions, behaviors, and emotions are rooted in and are, have their source in what are our core values. So there's the answer, right? If we're going to try and get a group of people to do something that we'd like them to do, all we need to do is understand what their values are. Simple. Now we'll have the answer to that mysterious 90% of the people who did not match the demographic and psychographic descriptions that we all start our campaigns and our marketing efforts with. But there's a problem. Of course, there's always a problem. The problem is there was no way to understand the shared values of an entire target audience of people. So we sat back and said, well, I guess we should build one because this will be the key to unlocking that big question. How do we get a group of people to do something we'd like them to do? If it's all about their values, we need to be able to say this group of people have these values in common so that we can just connect the dots between our thing, our product or service or brand, and the things that they're motivated by. Simple. Well, not so simple. We needed to find a model for this. So we looked to the Human Genome Project. Now, the Human Genome Project, I'm sure you remember about 10 years ago, the geneticists around the world got all excited because they'd finally collected all of the component parts and identified all the component parts that are necessary to understand a biological human. Call that the hardware for a human. Depending on which of those parts are in place, you're a tall, you're short, you're blonde, you're redhead, you've got dark hair, you're a man, you're a woman, you've got different amounts of pigment in your skin. All that stuff is determined by which of these things are in which place for you as an individual. So we said, that's it. We need to do the same thing. We're going to launch the Value Graphics Project and we're going to collect all the component parts that are necessary to understand the operating system that drives that human. What's the software for that hardware? That was the question we set out to answer. Now, we've done this. It's 750,000 surveys deep so far and counting. And 436 different metrics that we've measured around the world in 180 countries. We've had a team of translators working with us in 152 different languages. And at the end of the day, the database that we've built is more accurate than you need for a PhD from Harvard. Now, we have the world's first inventory of what everybody on the planet actually cares about what our core human values are. It's a kind of dictionary or an encyclopedia of decision-making. We know why this group of people decides to do this thing and why this other group of people decides to do that thing instead. Using this database, we can look at any target audience and tell you what their shared values are, what will motivate them and how to engage them, how to get them to pay attention and ultimately make the decision you would like them to make. Now we call it the value graphics database and we call these kinds of customer insights value graphics, but they play nicely and have to be part of what we call the three-legged stool of customer insights, consumer insights, audience insights, however you want to give this a label. So that three-legged stool, let's talk about these three legs. The first leg is demographics. 
demographics are still absolutely necessary in order to understand and describe what a group of people are. Sometimes, depending on the category you're in, knowing that they're male or female or young or old or rich or poor, sometimes those things are necessary to understand and kind of put a fence around your target audience. So we go back to my real estate days, you know, if we're gonna sell a penthouse in downtown Gotham City for $4 million, or downtown Gotham City is gonna be $50 million, that group of people are not going to be 18 year old women who work at the grocery store down the street. We know that's true but we have to have beyond understanding of what these folks are and where we've been going wrong is assuming that because we can describe what they are that we also know who they are. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So demographics still necessary, put a fence around the people, understand what they are, but let's not get those poor old demographics to do too much that they're not qualified to do. Let's move on and talk about psychographics, the second leg of the three-legged stool. Psychographics, there's a billion different definitions if you Google the word, but it's basically just a record of what's happened so far. How have these people behaved in the past? How have they felt about your product or brand or service? How many times have they been a customer? How much do they spend per visit to your online store? Those are all psychographic facts, and we've been collecting this data like crazy for the last 10 years. We have great giant piles of this data, in fact. And it all comes from exactly the same place, which is the past. Because as soon as you can write down something about a consumer or a group of consumers, it's happened. So it's now historical data. And psychographics are great because you can see this pattern that may or may not be there. And either way, if it's there or not there, it's information about how that pattern might continue. But if you want to get them to change their behavior or have a new decision, in their decision-making process, you need to understand what they care about. Because remember, what we value determines everything we do. So if you understand what a group of people values, you know how they're going to make a decision. If you have all three things, demographics to describe, psychographics to record, and value graphics, they help you activate, engage, motivate that group of people. You need all three. Now there's been a lot of talk online lately LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all kinds of places, blogs, newspapers, everywhere that I'm reading, that suddenly consumers are all sitting at home and acting on their values far more than they ever have before. That's not the case. There's a little bit of a fine line here that I wanna just go through before we move into the data that I brought with me today to share with you about PayPal consumers and how that applies to your particular situation. All that's happened over the last couple of years is the pandemic has kind of scaled up the evidence. We can see the whole world reacting to a thing. A thing happened and we all had a behavioral reaction to that. And we're sitting and saying, wow, people are actually motivated by their values. Like, you know what? They've always been motivated by their values. It's just when the whole world does something together, it's easy to see. Before this, all kinds of people doing all kinds of different things, it was less obvious. Now it's so obvious to corporations all over the world that we must understand the values of our target audience if we hope to engage them and motivate them in this new post-pandemic world. Our values have always driven what we do. It's just what being human is. Again, we're neurologically, biologically, psychologically, and sociologically hardwired to chase the things we value and run away from the things that might harm our values. So let's talk about this as it applies specifically to PayPal consumers. And we've gone out and collected a statistically representative sample of 6,750 PayPal users in five regions of the world. And the qualifying question to get into this sample and become this stat rep for these five regions of the world was they have to be people who shop online at least three times a month. So the data I'm gonna share with you right now is sort of an amalgamated result for all those people all over the world. We take their responses, what they've told us about their behaviors and then about their values and about their wants and needs and expectations. And we use that as a kind of typing tool that helps us extrapolate from the benchmark study of 750,000 surveys and go, wow, it's you guys, and this applies, and it's some of you guys, we've seen you before, old friends, come on out. And then we're able to say, here's what we know about that group of people. So the 6,750 PayPal users, they're just the start. What we've done with that information is use it to pull the rest of this rich contextualized data out of the Value Graphics database. 
Here's some parts of what we found. This is a typical value graphics chart. This shows you the top 10 most important, most motivating, engaging, and activating values for this group of people, PayPal users in the USA, UK, France, Germany, and Australia. Hey, Australia, hope you're watching. You'll see some of these are blue, family, belonging, and relationships. Family and belonging and relationships are part of what we call the togetherness cluster. There's five of them in total, and we love seeing these show up. And in fact, here's one of the most heartwarming and hopeful things that's come out of all this research all over the world. No matter what we do, no matter what client has asked us to do this on their behalf, whether we're in B2B, it can be technical, it can be B2C, it can be anything that you can imagine, always in the top 10 list, there's some values that are about being together. In this case, it's about family, belonging, and relationships. So if you do nothing else from today, other than just take away this one thought, that the best, most powerful thing you could do in order to connect your product or service or brand to the 425 million PayPal consumers out there is show them how they're part of the family. Now take that metaphorically. It doesn't have to be <laughs> actually bloodlines part of the family. How can you make them feel like this is good for their family and that you're part of their family and they're part of yours? How can you reinforce the belongingness about being one of your customers? And how can you help them feel like your product or service or brand is going to strengthen and enrich the relationships that they enjoy so much in their lives that they use it as a filtering mechanism to make every decision about everything they do all day long, 24-7, 365. Now we're going to focus on three of these values that we think are the most interesting as it relates to PayPal and some of the things that I know that you as online merchants have in front of you on a regular basis. Let's look at the value of loyalty, security, and experiences. Those three values are incredibly magnetic and powerful tools to attract the intention, engage, be magnetically activating for PayPal consumers. And there's a whole lot of PayPal customers all over the world. Don't you want more than your fair share of them? Of course you do. This is one way that you can get there. Let's look at those three values. Well, first, before we dive deep into those, you just need to think about the simplest and most obvious thing you can do to attract those 425 million PayPal customers around the world, which is just make sure everybody knows that you're a PayPal merchant partner. Because just by taking this logo and making it loud and proud somewhere on your site, you're going to be like magnetically talking to this group of people, whether they know it's happening for them or not. But this logo, this brand, this company means these things to them. So just by saying, hey, we're part of that group, we're part of that family, you belong over here, that's gonna be an incredibly powerful tool, just that. Let's go a little deeper though. Let's look at those three values, security, experiences, and loyalty, as they relate to three stages in the consumer journey. Acquisition, conversion, and retention. We all have to try and crack these three nuts, don't we? So let's use acquisition as a way to talk about how security can be an incredibly magnetic value for you and how experiences can help with conversion and how loyalty as a value for PayPal consumers can help you with retention. Here's the first one. If we're talking about acquisition, we all have to do this, right? We all have to get people to pay attention to us and engage with us and get in the top of the funnel, whatever kind of terminology you want to use for this stage in the process. But at some point you need to just go, hey, come on over here and pay attention to what I want to say to you for a little bit and see if this is something for you. So the acquisition portion. Now we're going to use security as a value to try and build acquisition rates that'll make everybody proud. Now, when we dig a little bit deeper into the value graphics database around security, specifically for PayPal consumers, we know that what that means to them, the way security manifests itself in their lives is around stability. They're magnetically attracted to anything that'll give them a sense that they're being, that the, they've got more stability in their lives, that all the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. There's no surprises waiting for them around the corner. So you need to celebrate your security strengths whatever those might be. Now there's a certain cost of entry around data security just to be in the market that you're in and doing the job that you're doing now, but what else you got? What's hiding in the back page of your website that you should be pulling out to the front page of your website and saying, we are so secure, you never seen anything so secure. We're the most secure thing since security was a baby. The more you can do to talk about security and emphasize those things, 
for customers, particularly PayPal consumers, the more magnetic you'll be. Now, part of the story here, of course, is that PayPal is the number two most trusted brand on the planet. That's because this security value is so loud and strong for PayPal consumers, it comes oozing out of that brand. And by being a PayPal merchant partner, you're already well on your way to using security in the most magnetic way possible. But think a little harder. What else have you got that can reinforce security? And that's gonna help you attract attention and get that acquisition rate up to where you'd like it to be. Let's move on to conversion, the second of these three stages in the consumer journey we're gonna talk about today. And to do this, we're gonna look at experiences as a value. Now experiences, again, when we dig a little deeper into the value graphics database and see what does experiences mean to this particular group of consumers, PayPal customers in those five regions of the world, what they mean is that it's all about responsibility before you have those experiences. Experiences are great as long as you're being responsible about those experiences. They don't, again, it kind of relates back to the first one, right? It's all about avoiding surprises. Don't do anything rash here. Don't do anything that's kind of off the cuff. Make sure you're looking after your responsibilities and then sure, by all means, go out and have all the experiences you want. A seamless and unique user experience will deliver this. Now you think about all the different places and all the different ways that PayPal can help you with this particular piece of the story and it's, it's legion. There's all the different ways you can check out, all the different platforms, all the different devices. Your consumer will have that seamless, unique UX just because you're a PayPal merchant partner. You need to reinforce that. You need to tell that story. Push it up to the front. Don't hide it on the back page. Make sure that it's a key part of your story. By the way, PayPal's not paying me to say this stuff. This is the data speaking and saying, these are the things you need to be doing in order to be magnetic for the PayPal consumer and get more than your fair share of them coming to your site. Let's look at retention. Now retention, we're gonna try and solve this one. How can we boost retention? We're gonna try and solve it by using the value and the importance that the PayPal consumer places on loyalty. Now again, when we dig a little deeper into the database and see what does the PayPal consumer mean when they talk about loyalty? It's loyalty that must be earned. You have to make the first move. They're not gonna. You need to be the ones that say, you know what, we're gonna be really loyal to you because if you do, it's a reciprocal value. These folks will be like, wow, you're gonna be loyal to me? Okay, I'll be loyal to you. I'll cut you a little bit of slack if I don't have the best customer service experience one day. Maybe I got somebody on the phone in tech support who's a little grumpy. It's okay, I'm loyal. We all want loyal customers. This is how retention rates get where we need them and want them to be. So remember, loyalty must be earned. So what's an easy way to do this is just to be noisy with your rewards program. PayPal can help you with this one too. Don't be shy about your rewards program. Don't leave it till checkout. Talk about it up front. Make sure everyone knows you have a rewards program, that you're offering them a gift, even if it's the most minor thing, to say, listen, I'd love you to be part of our family. I'd love you to be a part of the relationships that we value. I'd love you to feel like you belong here. Loyalty relates back to all the other values and telling this beautiful, complete story to the consumers that you're trying to acquire, trying to convert, and trying to retain. Values are the answer. They're kind of a great pathway that leads you to that intersection of purpose and profit. Now what we've been doing is what we call values thinking. It's, there's a big process we teach our clients how to do. It's kind of like design thinking and that's on purpose because we named it like that so it would trigger that and kind of stole their thunder a little bit. All it is is a simple process to help you understand how to make decisions, but instead of keeping design at the center, we'd like you to keep values at the center because after all, values determine everything we do. So values thinking boils down though to this, this simple two things. You gotta understand what you've got to offer. What are the features, advantages, benefits? What are the stories you can tell? Somehow you have to make a decision about which ones to put forward and to push to the front of your story in the marketing perspective. So choose the ones that relate to what they want. It's that simple. Look for the overlap between what you got and what they want. That's values thinking. That's what we've been doing. Saying, okay, using this value and this thing that we could talk about, let's find a place where they overlap and solve the problem that way. 
So that's values thinking. You're now all experts. You get a PhD in values thinking just for watching today. I'd like to end where we started and go back and think about those 90% of the people in the room who didn't match the other 10% who were part of the demographic and psychographic description that we had targeted with those million dollars that we'd spent on behalf of our real estate clients. Who were those 90%? Why were they so different than everybody else, than that 10% that we had attracted? Well, now we know. It turns out they weren't so different after all. They're actually identical. We were just using the wrong set of lenses to try and figure this out. We were looking at them demographically and saying, well, gee, they're not Bob and Sally. There are different sizes and shapes and colors and ages and incomes, and they don't match them at all. But where it matters, on the inside, their core motivating values, they were identical across that room. The demographics were less important. That's not how people decide to do something. How people decide to do something is if it aligns with their values. So everybody in that room had the same set of values. We just didn't know we were doing this. Well, now we do, and now we can do it in advance. And that's what I hope I've shown you how you can do today. But let me end with this thought. What we're talking about today is bigger than all of that. Much bigger, in fact. It's bigger than all of us, bigger than all of our companies combined. Because the longer we continue to use what we now know are incredibly inaccurate demographic ideas about people, the longer we're perpetuating these demographic stereotypes. Think about that for a moment. If we think about the world based on whether they're male or female, that forces us to use stereotypes about men and women. You know, boomers, they're all bad with technology. Millennials, they love their avocado toast. Gen Z, they're still living in their parents' basements. These kinds of stereotypical ideas about demographic groups, they just perpetuate these harmful, hurtful, inaccurate stereotypes. They're not helping us at work. And in fact, they're causing a great deal of harm all over the world because those stereotypes are the root cause of racism, and sexism, and ageism, and homophobia, and so many other problems that this poor, poor planet of ours is rocked with every single day. The sooner we can leave demographic stereotypes behind, the better off we're gonna be at work, and the better off the whole world's gonna be. And there's good news. It's so easy to do well and do good. We don't have to build new factories. We don't have to buy new equipment. We don't have to invest heavily in infrastructure. All we have to do is simply change the way we look at people, change the way we look at our target audiences, change the way we look at each other. And if we do that, our organizations will thrive, will do very, very well. It'll be far more powerful than using outdated demographic ideas and psychographic data from the past. And if we do that, we can also change the world. We can do better and we can do good and we can do it all at the same time. How often does that kind of opportunity come along? I want to thank you all for listening today. And uh, please go out there, think about a values-driven approach to whatever it is you have in front of you and spread the word. I hope you're having a great day. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, David, for the insight. That was really interesting and, and helpful. And next time, I'm thrilled to welcome Blaine LeBron, the Vice President of Digital Commerce and Technology at Prest. Blaine has been a key part of the growth at Prest and really the evolution of the brand and the expansion into new channels. Um, and you're going to hear from him in a moment. But first, I wanted to share a quick video that highlights the Prest consumer experience. Let's go ahead and roll the video. Press, we always strive to be accessible. It's part of our mission. So accessibility for nutrition and accessibility about ways that you can pay. And PayPal allows us to do that. Just log in and you're done with your transaction. Now we're thinking, what can we do in the future, both from a digital standpoint and also an in-store experience standpoint? When we launched our VIP program three years ago, we started using QR codes as a way to pay. It's a very seamless transaction for our customer, and I think they love it, and I personally love it too. And PayPal's been a part of that. And they're continuing to innovate in this space as customers become more comfortable using QR codes to pay. So what I'm excited about is PayPal is thinking ahead 
for us so we don't have to worry about what customers will want. The thing our customer always asks for is just a better experience, both in-store and online. PayPal will be there to help us do that. All right, welcome Blaine, and thanks so much for joining us today. Jason, thanks for having me. We are so excited to be here. Awesome. Well, we have a very interesting topic and theme today. Um, I want to just dive right in, but first, um, I think it would be great if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about Press. There might be some people in the audience who are not that familiar with your business, not that familiar with your brand. So tell us about it. Yes, thank you. Pressed is a cold pressed juice and plant based treats business with over 100 locations nationwide in seven states. At our core is our retail experience and our brick and mortar stores. Some customers may be curious on how to add plant based foods into their diet, and our store teams are there to help educate customers on ways our products can do just that. Also, our products aren't just juice. Uh, we have cold pressed juice, acai bowls, and we also have a plant-based soft serve that tastes really great. We believe that living a plant-forward lifestyle doesn't mean you have to sacrifice flavor for nutrition. Excellent, and it's it's been so great to see the growth of your business. And in fact, I, I love that I saw that um, just four short years ago, uh, your digital sales, they've grown so much four years ago, Digital sales accounted for, I think, 2% of your overall sales. And that number has now grown to an impressive 65% and continues to increase. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, what, what's driving that? What steps did you guys take to see such an impressive increase in digital sales? This is like one of my favorite metrics because prior to the pandemic, we already embarked on an endeavor to create a digital platform to support this kind of growing business and all of our new sales channels. Pre-pandemic, we were at 25% digital sales really fueled by our VIP program, which utilized QR codes for payment. Now everybody's familiar with the QR code, um, but back then it was actually kind of odd to our customer. Uh, when the pandemic hit, within weeks, we were able to pivot the business and added things like curbside pickup, contactless payments, and local delivery straight from our platform. A lot of businesses really had a challenge doing that. Um, the news back in the day was everyone trying to get on Uber and Grubhub and all these different services. We already had a lot of our business coming through our digital properties. So we were able to pivot basically overnight. So overnight, our business went to about 85% digital which uh, you know we expected, but then here we are two years later at 65%, and I think the most surprising aspect is that customers enjoy the level of convenience these digital sales channels offer them, and they continue to use them. It's also fueling our membership and VIP programs, which continue to really grow, speaking to the concept that customers really value through their loyalty those kind of um, offerings. Great, and I know that you you have a very customer-centric mindset at Prest. And when you think about the key strategies that have really fueled your growth, um, what role did understanding the consumer play in the evolution of Prest marketing strategy? Yeah, we actually did an exercise a few years ago to really understand the different types of customers coming to Prest. And one of my favorite personas that came out of this was the Prest enthusiast. And our customers are extremely loyal to the brand and not only purchase themselves, but also promote us to their family, their friends and coworkers. And I love being in stores and speaking to these customers. They always have like the best ideas and not just from a product standpoint, but most of my tech roadmap is built around requests from our customer. Alternate payment methods in our flows was something I got from our customers as well. They wanted an easier, shorter, contactless way to check out or sign up for a VIP program or a recurring orders program. And I was really impressed with the adoption of PayPal and Venmo. Uh, when we implemented the drop-in UI from Braintree, we also saw things like a 57% increase in average order value over like traditional credit cards with Venmo customers. And back to this idea of loyalty, being a pressed enthusiast is one of my favorite things about Venmo. It's not just a payment platform, it's also a social platform where people are sharing what they're purchasing and their love for a brand. That's great. Yeah, a lot of our merchant partners really love that social aspect of Venmo as well. 
Um, relatedly, I wanted to talk for a minute about loyalty. So earlier in the discussion, we heard David speak about the importance of loyalty, right? Um, leaving consumers with a positive brand experience uh, that ultimately drives repeat purchase. In your mind, what does customer loyalty mean for Prest? And how are you investing in supporting um, that effort to drive loyalty? I mean, one of the things I love about being at Prest is that we've always been an innovator. Uh, when I first started four years ago, our VIP program was just a concept and you paid $10 a month and that $10 could be used to buy our products at a special VIP price, both in store and online. The concept for customers at first was a little confusing because we weren't charging a fee like everybody else. If you enjoyed two press products a month, it was a no brainer because you'd save money. Obviously, this spoke to our core consumer, which is why the program really took off. It outpaced any of our initial goals. And now this concept has really expanded and is more commonplace in the market. But we were kind of, I think, one of the first to market with a concept like this. More recently, though, one of our goals has been to make products even more accessible. And during the pandemic, we solidified our press post model. I'm very proud of it. It is our take on a ghost kitchen. So rather than using a commercial space or commercial kitchen, we partner with a small business like a coffee shop or a restaurant, and they fulfill our pickup and local delivery orders. And then we pay them a revenue share for the orders that they fulfill. It fuels loyalty for the customer because like a really great example is one of our customers in Whittier when we opened that press post was so excited because uh, she was driving all the way to Pas Pasadena and LA traffic for 45, 50 minutes to enjoy press products. Um, but now with a post in her neighborhood and in her community, um, they could just pick it up down the street. It's just another way we're driving loyalty through convenience. The other thing I love about the press program too is it benefits our customer, but it also benefits the small business owner because now they're also gaining revenue um, without any additional labor. And one of my favorite stories coming out of this was uh, one of our operators actually gave a raise to all of her staff uh, with the money that she had received from press for fulfilling our orders. That's great. And I, I love the press post model and, and the impact that that's having on the community and how that really ties in with the, the shared core values that I know your organization has and, and that we have as well. Um, and also, I wanted to talk about how did your payment strategy fit into the larger business objectives? And, and as you were discussing your strategic plan internally, I, I'm curious, how did that go? What, what did the conversations with your leadership team look like? Yeah, I mean, when we were vetting a payment processor for our digital platform, we had uh, a formal vetting process. Uh, the payment space is full of legacy technology and finding partners that we could scale with our platform is the differentiator here. PayPal has been an amazing partner to work with and they were able to power our subscription VIP program without all the fees that other providers typically charge. And um, also the PayPal tech is built with ease of implementation in mind. My dev team loves working with Braintree because it's so easy to work with and implement. That's great. And we obviously very much appreciate the partnership as well. Um, I have just one more question for you. So as you look off into the future, obviously you've got lots of opportunities in front of you. What's next for Prest? Oh, we definitely have some plans for the brand. And um, I think the overall goal is to continue to innovate within the quick service restaurant space. Um, my motto has always been uh, with Tech at Press to create a frictionless experience for our customer, but not just our customer, also our retail associates. So this year we're focusing on in-store tech to allow our associates to focus on what they do best, which is educating our customers, interacting with them, driving loyalty that way. And we want a seamless checkout both in store as well as online. So that's gonna be our focus this year, um, as well as interesting projects like Press Post. So we're really exciting, uh, excited for the, the future. Fantastic, I can't wait to see it. And uh, we're thankful to be your partner and, and be on that journey with you. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for sharing your story and your valuable insight. Really appreciate it. Great, thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. Absolutely, and, and to our audience, as we wrap up today, once again, I just wanted to thank David and, and Blaine for joining us 
Um, we hope you had some, took away some, some good insight and um, possibly even were inspired by the discussion today and the significance of understanding and delivering against consumer core values. I think that's the key. Um, and I'll say for us at PayPal, we know that winning the hearts and minds of consumers doesn't only happen at checkout, right? It happens across the entire customer journey. And that's why we're investing, constantly investing in um, really understanding the core values uh, of our customers. And we're investing in innovation to develop new solutions beyond transactional payment tools that will help you drive brand loyalty and retain more customers. So with that, I'm gonna close out. And in a few minutes, uh, you're gonna see the event uh, survey pop up in your screen. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks again, everyone, for joining and have a great day.